My name is Nick Schwalek and I'm with 3D Systems. Today we're here to talk about Keymagic Capture for DesignX. What we're going to do is I'll give you a couple quick slides to introduce it and then we'll go into a live demo. So we're talking about Geomagic Capture. This is a desktop scanner and what we're going to do is we're going to scan this part here on the table and we're going to reverse engineer it in DesignX. This is a complete solution and it includes the scanning device, it includes the software, and DesignX is, uh, has what's called live transfer. And this allows you to transfer the completed model with full history tree. Some people call it a, a parametric solid model. You'll be able to send that over to Siemens NX, uh, PTC Creo, and ProE, SolidWorks, and Autodesk Inventor. And the great part is that you have, like I said, when you're done, a full parametric history-based model. Geomagic Design X is the fastest path to CAD, and like I said, it's going to get you into those packages very quickly. Now, Capture for Design X, uh, some of you may have attended the Capture for SolidWorks uh, presentation a couple weeks ago. The main difference is that Capture for Design X is as a complete standalone package. So if you don't have a package of CAD, you can use this. Uh, it's also, uh, Capture is also available as plugins for so, um, so SolidWorks and SpaceClaim. So those are available as well. And we also have another uh, Capture for Design Direct, which is uh, another standalone package. Uh, this works easily with your own data. And again, we can capture data from this device. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a live demo. I will talk a little bit about the hardware for a moment here. The scanner, which you can see here, is a blue LED structured light scanner. It projects an image down onto the part here. And we have a standoff distance of about 300 millimeters. This is to the center of the sweet spot where you're scanning. The depth of the field of view is about 180 millimeters. Uh, this is a lot like when you have a SLR camera and you have the distance that you're, uh, that you're focused within. So this is the distance that you're going to have the best capture of data. In the front, because this is a trapezoidal shape here, in the front we're at about 124 by 120 millimeters. That's the size of the box here. Then in the back, we're at 192 by 175 millimeters. So you can see you can scan very big parts. If you have parts that are too big for that volume, you can see I have white dots on this part here. These are targets, and targets are uh, allow you to uh, move the scanner along the part if, if it's too big to fit in the volume. Uh, the scanner will align with these, so it will align actual shots from the scanner with subsequent shots that were taken earlier. It will also use geometry, so you don't have to use these targets. If the part has a lot of geometry that will lock, allow it to lock itself together, you can use that, and it works very, very well. Um, this one, for demonstration sake, we put these on because we wanted to tell you about them and wanted you to know that there is an option to use them, and it's, it's really nice. Some folks will put targets onto a, uh, a rotary table and then rotate the part just by hand. You don't need to drive it at all. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce Geomagic Design X. This is the, the product that's shown on the screen. This is uh, the premier reverse engineering and uh, design from scan data solution. Again, here's the scanner. So to get started, we're going to go up into insert and scanner direct control. Uh, we're going to use Geomagic Capture. That's the, the device we have. But we also support a lot of the other scanners on the market and uh, direct control of those scanners. So when you buy this system, if you have legacy devices in your organization, you can take advantage of those as well. We're going to connect, and when we connect, it initializes the connection of the device. Uh, data is sent over Ethernet, so it's an extremely fast connection. We get a lot of data very quickly. And this is the scan window. So what you can see here is a preview of the part. You can see, uh, as I bring my finger into the view, you can see my finger in the camera. But inside the view here, we can see the part. We can see the targets are, are bright, and we can see the part's pretty easy to view. 
Now what we want to do is we want to make sure that our exposure is, is set correctly. So if it's too high, this is red, this means it's overexposed and you're not going to get good data. It's, it'll be very washed out. And if it's too low, it's too dark. We can't actually see anything. So we can use auto exposure and that will adjust it automatically for us. And it gets it very, very quickly and gives you a nice setting. So here it's telling me 17 milliseconds. Some other things that you can adjust. Remember I talked about targets. Those are turned on here. You could choose to use best fit and you can choose not to align at all. Uh, I like to use targets and uh, best fit. Those work well. We can also adjust the resolution of the scan that we get. In this case, we're doing a demo. So, and this part here is also uh, nice and prismatic. So we, we can actually scan it in low resolution and be, uh, be able to collect everything that we need. So what I'll do is I'll make sure it's oriented nice and it's in the center of my, uh, my scan volume here. And I'll hit scan. You can see the pattern shift across the part. Now since this is a structured light scanner, it's using, um, using that pattern and as a, the pattern shifts, we're actually taking the, uh, the XY position and then the Z is calculated by the shift. So you can see here's our first shot, that looks pretty good. We'll take another shot. This one here we need, you know, six or so shots to go around the part. You can see on the screen here as we go around we're filling it in. Okay. So we are doing this live. This is a real, real part, real data, and a real scan. This looks pretty good. We'll keep going. And we probably want one more scan. You can see we, we're missing a little bit of data up here. Let's see how this looks. All right, uh, we'll take just one more shot to make sure we got the, the end there. The nice thing is that if you do miss any data, it's really easy to add it back in. Okay, so I finished scanning and we're going to turn off the video so you can't see me, but you'll get to see me again when we do the uh, questions and answers. I'm going to hit the checkbox here and finish uh, capturing my scan data. Uh, I don't need to run my mesh buildup wizard. What we can see on the screen now is all the different scans. We have six scans. The scans are shown on the left side here. And what we need to do now is combine those into a single object. Since we're, we're modeling from the scan data, we want, you can, you can model from an individual scan, but the best practice is to combine these all together. So we're going to go up into the scan tools and I'm going to align between the scans. That's just to fine tune the alignment. So if we look up here, we can see there's uh, yellow is pr prominent here, green is prominent. So we have scans that are potentially just slightly out of alignment. So I'm going to pick all my scans and I'm going to run my alignment. So the alignment runs very quickly and then we'll see the scans move ever so slightly. And what I'm looking for is kind of this marbleized look. That, that shows me that everything is, uh, is aligned and they're overlapping very, very nicely. So I'm, I'm happy with that. And the next thing is to merge these together. So again, back to the scan tools and we're gonna run this merge command. We'll pick all the scans. You can see they're all picked and we're going to hit the checkbox. So the software now is going to take the best data of each scan and combine that into one single object and then we'll see that one single object show up in our feature tree on the left. Okay. So here we have the model on the screen. And what I would like to do now is just check one more thing. What we'd like to do is make sure that the mesh isn't uh, too big. So we're going to make it 250,000 triangles. The reason for that is it, uh, we're going to be able to throw out some of the 
extraneous extra data and also reduce it down just a little bit. All right. So that's it. That's it for scanning. You know, we capture the data and then we put it together to make a single scan. Now if we wanted to scan the bottom of this, we could easily flip the part over, scan the bottom, and then combine those together using those same tools. For demonstration's sake, for demonstration's sake, we're going to take this and um, start modeling now. So let's, let's stop and do a quick poll at this point. And what we will do is uh, get to aligning and modeling after we do that poll. All right, we're, <clears throat> we're done with the poll, so back to modeling. Now, what I want you to see is if we look at some standard views, top, bottom, left, right, the part is nicely aligned to one of the views, and that, that's because the scanner is angled down at the table. Well, to model this part, we'd like for it to be, you know, the, the faces here, we'd like that to be the table. So we need to align this thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with region grouping. And region grouping is, is kind of the core of the, the process. What it gives us is nice selections. And those selections can be used for things like alignment, for fitting, for creation of sketches, for building the model. This is going to give us all the things we need to do to create a really nice finished CAD model of this part. So what it's doing is it's looking for edges and breaking the model up into pieces. And then it's even classifying those things as certain types of geometry. So if I mouse over the table here, it says it's a plane. And that's good because we know that the table that it's sitting on is planar. And the great thing is we can use this plane. We can use these cylinders. We'll use those for the alignment. I'm going to click on interactive alignment. And we're going to move this object. This is the captured scan. And we have two windows here. The window on the left is what we're picking, and the window on the right is the aligned state. So it shows us here we're going to do a 3 two, one alignment. The first item is a plane, so I'll pick that. You can see the object snapped. The second item is a line or a vector, so I can actually pick the cylinder in the center of the part. And we can see now the origin is aligned to the middle of the part. That's great. That's what I wanted. So I'm going to accept that. And now you're probably wondering, what is, you know, we've got a little bit of extra table here. We don't really need to model that. So I'm going to show you a neat trick. This is for some of the folks that already know DesignX. You may not have known this trick. <clears throat> so I'll click that plane and click Delete. And we're actually deleting all of the scan data. That's there. And we'll go back into the, the regular mode and we're going to start making CAD model now. So again, just to prove it's aligned, we can see that the part is, is ready to go. And we'll turn the region colors back on. And you can see here we are. Now when I model a part like this, I like to figure out how it might have been modeled before. Uh, in this case, I know it's extruded. I can see that by the general shape. So we're going to think about that a little bit. We also have some areas here that are cut out. We have these pockets. And then we have a bunch of holes. And there's also this hole on the side here. And, and it finishes off with a, uh, a torus or a, a, a ring up here for uh, an O-ring or a gasket of some sort. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a mesh sketch. And the mesh sketch lets us pick a plane where we want to sketch. And if I hide my, my geometry, you can see as I drag this up, we can put the cutting plane anywhere on the model. What I'd like to do is bring it up just a little bit off the table so I can actually get a nice sketch on the bottom. And we're going to accept that. Now that I've got a slice through the part, we need to turn this into a sketch that we can extrude. Inside of DesignX, we have all of the standard sketching tools, just like any modern CAD package. I'm going to pick a circle, and you can see as I mouse over, these are highlighted in yellow. So I'll pick the first segment. And this looks pretty good, but it's not fit all the way. So I can continue to pick segments, and then double click to finish. And my circle is fit very nicely to that set of data. 
We'll do the same over here. I'll pick segments and I'll fit my circle. That looks pretty good. Now what if you have something that's maybe slightly more difficult to sketch? You know, these profiles here. Well, we'll use the auto sketch and I'm going to just pick my objects and create my sketch. So let's do that again. You can easily pick segments and here you go. So we'll accept that sketch and we have a little bit of editing to do. We'll just drag that back here. We'll make those tangent and then we'll extend these up to the circle. So I'll use my extend tool. Extend and then we need to do these up here. So we'll do the same thing. You can do it like that or you can use the regular circle tool. This is pretty neat. You can pick your areas and we have our circles. And then we'll do, do a little bit of trimming. Again, this should feel very familiar. should feel just like a standard CAD, CAD thing. So we'll go, we'll go into trim. We'll do power trim. And we have just a little bit left here. You've probably all done this before where you just need to remove another small segment. And then again, we'll, we'll fix our constraints, make those tangent, make those tangent, and then pull, pull that up just a little bit. That looks pretty good. Got a little bit more trimming to do down here. One thing to note, that I'd like to point out is over on the right hand side here we have what's called the accuracy analyzer. I have disjointed ends turned on. You can see those are basically open ends and we would like for this to be a sketch for everything to be closed. So I trimmed that out but we still have one here so we'll just do a corner trim to finalize. That looks good. Now I'm not putting in fillets here yet. We'll do that later and I'll show you a very cool tool that will automatically figure out what the radius of those fillets should be. Let's turn the scan back on. Now we need to make an extrusion. So we'll use our extrude tool. And we can see that it's starting to extrude. Now, how do we know where to stop? Well, the great thing is the software will actually pick a face and snap to that. So we know that the extruded height is exactly to the scan. And the bottom is based on the table. So we know the bottom of the part is sitting on the table we know the top of the part is extruded up to the very top here and we're making all the corrections needed in case the top was tilted or maybe damaged in some way. We can also apply draft to the part. So if we need to apply a negative two degrees of draft, we can. This is a choice that you get to make as the person modeling the part. Some people like to model the part without any draft and then add that in later in CAD when you're creating your tooling. Other people like to model it from the beginning with that because they know that there's something, it's, it's very complicated and they may need to include that. So this is your choice. For this particular part, I'm not going to add that in. What I'd like to do is show you that accuracy analyzer. And we can see that the top is red. This means that the top of my CAD model is a little bit too large. And we know that's because there's draft on it. But this is a decision that I'm choosing to make. I'd like for that to be straight. Okay, we have a little bit more geometry to make. We'll do another sketch and I'm going to pull this down and accept that. We're going to hide both of the, uh, the scan and the CAD body and we're going to make our circles that we're going to cut out. So we're going to go ahead and do an extrude cut. I'm going to turn the scan back on and the solid body is there but we're just toggling the visibility. Reason for that is I want to again pull down to to that face. You can see it highlights as we cut down to it and hit the checkbox, turn my solid body back on and you can see we've got the cuts made. All right, we're just about there. We need to create a couple more sketches, a couple more mesh sketches for the 
the geometry, we need to cut through and figure out where those holes are. So we're going to do that again. You can see it's it's very easy. It's super fast. The modeling is to your scan data, so you get exactly what you want. Again, we'll do an extrude cut. This time we'll turn the solid on so we can see, and we'll cut down. All right, that looks good. Then one more set of holes. Again, mesh sketch. We go down a little bit so we get those. We're going to hit the checkbox, create some circles, and we'll cut those out. All right, that looks pretty good so far. We have two more things that we need to finish on this. We have a hole in the side of the part, and we also have the groove on the top. So the hole in the side of the part, what I'm going to do is create a, another sketch on that plane. I can pull this up slightly, and we're going to create a, another circle on this. And we're going to cut that out. So you can see this, this is all very, very familiar. I really enjoy modeling like this. It's uh, quite fast, and you're able to get your results very, very accurately. And at this point, you know, if you needed to, you could easily double-click on the circle, pick these, and you could change the constraints. We'll continue to use our, our modeling tools and cut these out. So we're going to cut this and just make sure that we cut to the inside. There we go. That looks pretty good. Now we have some fillets to create. We haven't done those yet. So what I want to do now is go into the filleting tool. So I'm going to pick the fillet tool, and I'm going to pick my edges that I need to fill it. Let's set this to a small value at first, and then I'll show you the tool that will automatically create the right radius. So you can see, I just set it to one millimeter as, a, as an initial value, but if I click on this magic wand here, this is going to estimate the radius from the mesh. So it's taking the four fillets and saying, based on the scan data, you've got a 4.914 millimeter radius. Now I'm guessing that's probably supposed to be 5 millimeter. So let's set it to 5 and accept that. There we go. The last thing is to put this, uh, the groove in the top. And for, for me, you know, I can look at this and it's classified as a torus, so I know it's round. But what if we decide to make a design change? We want to make this into a square groove because we're going to use a, a different type of O-ring for the seal. What I'll do is I'm going to show you how to create that, but then you can go ahead and in any cat package, you can create your, uh, your other shape, or you can even do it in here. You can create your plane through your cylinder, through your axis of your cylinder, and then you'll have your nice rotation. We're going to use what's called the revolution wizard. This is the first time I'm showing you a wizard. Uh, wizards are great tools. They will actually let you pick a bunch of the geometry. And as you, you choose your geometry, you can then choose what you want to uh, rotate around that. So I'm picking the inside there. That looks good. And now I'll choose my rotational axis, which is the cylinder. I'm going to click forward. Well, it'll give me a preview. So what it's giving me a preview of is a circle here that's cut, and I'm happy with that, and I'll accept it. So let's turn the scan off and turn the solid back on, and look at that. It added it in, but that's easy enough to do. We're in a history-based modeler. I'm going to edit the feature and change it to a cut. The reason why I'm showing you this is as you model, these are standard tools. This is what you're going to do. You can go back in and change it. So we're going to change it. And now we've got a completed model. We'll check the deviation one more time. Again, I made the side square, and you can see that. The cut here and everything else is green. This part's within plus minus 0.1 millimeter, and that's pretty small. 
considering this is a cast part. So now we're at a point where we're going to do a, we're going to stop for another poll, and then after the poll, I'm going to show you how to get this into uh, PTC Creo, and we're going to bring this model into Creo. So we're back. Uh, what I'll do now is I'm going to take uh, Design X, stick it on the left there, and Creo and stick it on the right. Again, we've got our model here, and we'd like to have a native part inside of Creo. Let's say that your organization uses Creo for its day-to-day -day activities, and you need to hand this model off. You've completed your specific tasks, and now it's ready to go to the next guy. And that person is going to uh, take this model and uh, work with it, maybe do some iterations on it, make some changes, and finish up the, the rest of the work. So what we're going to do is go up to the File menu and go to Live Transfer. Uh, Live Transfer supports a lot of different packages. We support SolidWorks, Siemens NX, Creo and Pro-E, AutoCAD, Autodesk Inventor, SolidEdge, Katia uh, V4 and V5. So we're going to choose Creo, and in the dialog here, uh, this, is a, this is something I really like. Uh, what we can do is we can start from the beginning, starting from the first feature. You can also choose to start from a, sele uh, a selected feature. So if you want to start halfway down, you can do that. You can choose to send only a portion of it. That's really useful if you've started building something and uh, sent it over to CAD to uh, do a little bit of work, maybe do some uh, geometry that isn't included in the model. And then you get back into Design X and you start sending additional information over. So that's a nice way to take a break and uh, use your geometry as you need it. And the last thing is only selected entities. So that would send just the item that you've picked. Now in this case, we're going to start from the beginning. The items in the history tree will have a prefix called Design X. You can change this to anything you want. I like to have it say something different just so that when I'm working on the model later, I know where the geometry came from. If you don't want somebody to know where that came from, you can change that. You can blank it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit the checkbox. We're going to start from the beginning. And we're going to open another window for Creo. And then we're going to see the model generated. Now, I'm not doing anything. I'm not touching the keyboard. The extrusion is created. The cuts are created. The holes are created and I finish with a successful export. Now, if you run into any errors, uh, sometimes you may make some geometry which uh, conflicts with some other geometry, uh, especially in Creo. Um, PTC products are very uh, particular about the way they accept geometry. So if you have any errors, you can go and fix those, easily fix those. But what I want to show is there's my fillets. Those are here, called fillet one. My extrude cut through the side here is shown. All of my geometry is now native entities inside of Creo. So you can easily go in here and pick, pick a geometry. And you can go in and edit the sketch. What I want to show is these are actual values on the sketch. Now we didn't do any idealizing, we didn't tweak it, we didn't uh, change those. So in a value that's uh, you know 0.63 or 0.5 or something that's 2.1, you can easily go back in and change those and then finish the uh, editing the sketch. So here, here we see, again, finished product, finished part, complete history tree, going from an initial scan here in Design X through to a finished parametric solid model. Okay. Turning my webcam back on so you guys can see me. Hello again. And we're going to open it up for our questions and answers. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the questions over in the, the side here uh, in, that you guys have typed in uh, during the event. The first one is, what is the precision of the system? Uh, a lot of the specs are all listed on the website. We recommend you check them out. The, generally speaking, though, uh, a lot of folks are interested in kind of the resolution and the size of the part, or they're interested in um, the accuracy that's measured. 
Um, this is generally good for about two and a half thousandths. So this particular type of device is for desktop design, uh, reverse engineering, some inspection, but your inspection tolerances have to be, uh, you know, when you have a two and a half thousandths on your device, probably about ten thousandths um, tolerance for your part. That way you can ensure and make the QA manager happy that your values are correct because they're going to do qualification on those measurement devices. Again, this is intended for this type of work. You know, we're doing desktop reverse engineering. I have my scanner, I have my laptop, and I have a part that fits on this size here. Uh, another question is, can the data be automatically transferred to Geomagic Qualify, or what it's called today is Control? Uh, absolutely, and we're going to have a follow-up webinar that will show you guys how that all works. Um, it's a fantastic process and it works very, very well. There's a question where it asks, do we have a rotary stage? Um, I currently have a two-axis table and would like to add translation as well. Is that possible without targets? Uh, I would Today, the ships uh, without control for a, a table, uh, we do have uh, the target support. So I would recommend uh, using this today, you could easily have a system like that with translation and two rotation axes, but I'd recommend that you have targets on the stage. And having targets on the stage will allow you to move that part all around and maintain, uh, maintain that. Here's a great question. There's a question where it says, does the surface need to be prepared before scanning. Uh, you can see this is a, a cast aluminum part, so this doesn't need to be prepared. But if it's shiny black or it's translucent, then it's generally a good idea to uh, spray that with some sort of powder. And that will knock down the shine and also will make the, the visual, uh, the image that the cameras see, make it easier to see, uh, make it easier to see that. Uh, Every single structured light scanner on the market will require some sort of preparation. So this isn't something that's, uh, you know, that users aren't used to. Uh, we recommend uh, developer spray. That works well. Uh, a lot of times when we're out in the field, in the wild, we will stop by a store and we'll pick up some foot powder. That's a great substitute. And generally, you don't usually need an MSDS for that, so that's nice. All right, and let's see here. Uh, moderator, would you like to read off the couple more questions for us, please? Sure. So one of the questions that uh, has been coming back um, a few times here is, is scanning the bottom of the part. And there's a lot of people kind of asked, um, you know, uh, how do you how do you get to this bottom? What's, what's its importance? So can you talk about a little bit about the necessity for that and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. You can see the part does have a bottom. So on a particular part like this, uh, we've got the targets on it. So I can put additional targets on the side along here, and those additional targets would allow me to flip this over. And because I could see those targets, we could actually use those for the alignment. Now, there may be some geometry that you can't do that. Uh, there may be some complex shapes. And within the software, there are alignment tools. I showed you those down here at the bottom. Those are the alignment wizards. That allows you to align the part to the coordinate system. Uh, up in the top, in the uh, scan tools, there's alignment between scans. You can actually take individual scans and snap those together by picking part of uh, areas that correspond from one scan to another. Pretty straightforward. You know, this part isn't all that exciting on the bottom, so that's why we only showed you the top. But again, you can choose to use targets, or you can choose to use corresponding areas on the model where you pick those. Um, and I know you've talked a little bit about the rotary table, but just a couple more questions I think maybe to find kind of help fine tune that. One, and then I'll read both off here. It's, uh, 
is there a module to coordinate motion of the rotary table with the shots? And the additional question was, when will capture have support for rotating tables? Could you answer both of those kind of combined? Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, we all know that a rotary table is very important, and um, development is working on that. The, uh, it's something that's easily added in, but I can't comment on the time when it's available, but I can tell you that it's something that uh, we know we need to put in. It's, uh, it's going to be available. And, but I, I, again, I can't comment on when it would be available. Uh, as far as the control, I would expect that you know, when there is a, uh, a rotary table enabled and available, that you would have the control for it. Generally, most rotary tables allow you to say, uh, you know, I want four positions, so it rotates 90 degrees. I want eight positions, 12, 16. You choose the number of positions that you want it to rotate around, and then it will take that number of shots. And having done a prior calibration on it, you put a, a plate with a pattern on it and then take shots of that as it rotates, and the system will calibrate for that. Uh, that's provided you don't move the scanner with, re with respect to the table. That's what you're calibrating is the position of the table with respect to that. So. Uh, that's basically the answer. You know, it's a, you know product management and uh, internally, they'll work together to uh, figure out when we would release something like that. But when it's released, I would expect there to be a lot of control over the process. Um, can you explain a little bit? So there are a couple questions regarding the scanner. Um, so one is. Uh, does the scanner come with certification documents? And can you explain how the machine is calibrated? Okay, the this particular device does not come with certification documents. Those are um, users can use their methods internally to certify it. Uh, as far as calibration, it's all done from the factory. So the calibration is for the camera and the lenses and the projection, and that's all done internally using uh, uh, calibrated artifacts. Um, clearly, DesignX appears to be robust in dealing with prismatic geometry, but the curiosity here was how does DesignX work with a sculpted surface, um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how Capture can or can't assist in that process. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, this particular part, we choose a part like this because we want you as the, the attendee to be able to see how robust that process is and, and how easy it is and, and generally how you work through that, that workflow. On a part with a lot of organic or complex geometry, that's easily to, easy to scan as well. In fact, uh, organic geometries are easier to scan because they don't have as many, uh, you know, they may not have as many occluded areas that are, that are harder to see. Um, once you do that, there are tools where you can actually do uh, mesh fit, which allows you to pick the mesh, and there's also an auto surface where you can wrap a NURBS surface around the object. Since it is organic, say you scan a, a rock, for example, there generally isn't going to be much parametric uh, detail about that. So you could actually drape a nerve surface over it and have a really nice model that you could use downstream. Let's say it's something that is a combination of that freeform geometry and prismatic geometry. A tool and die is an excellent example. A tool may be originally machined and designed with a lot of prismatic stuff. But we all know that when it goes through finishing, the, uh, the die maker will, will smooth parts of the geometry and they'll, they'll knock down edges and make everything so that the part ejects nice and it looks nice when it comes out. Well, you're going to want to identify those as freeform areas if you're going to make exactly the same die. So you'd use this mesh fit tool up here and that would give you the ability to fit those freeform geometries. Thanks. Um, somebody, uh, so a couple things, Nick. One was a suggestion. Uh, to let people know or you know kind of came through is the, one could scan a ball bar to do the self certification process with the scanning device um, do you think is, is that something you agree with or do you have other methodologies you suggest as well no that, that's a that's a good point so uh, we've actually done that internally and we we did that internally to prove to ourselves that the uh, the values that we got you know the the tolerances that we're able to uh, publish you know, match. These are these are manufactured, and then we get those here, and we're the users in you know in this office. 
So you can position the ball bar in different places. Generally, you place it at the back of the scanning volume at the front, and then you turn it in different orientations, and then you, you fit a sphere to the ends, and then you measure the distance between the sphere centers. That's a tried and true method. Uh, you know, anybody, you can present that to anybody in your organization. They'll understand it, they'll get it, and you can easily prove to yourself. Now, you can, you know, have subject, you know, there are um, some subjective things. The ball bar, for example. Some ball bars are titanium spheres, some are ceramic. And some ceramics, you have to be careful because the blue light, any light, white light or blue light, will absorb slightly into the ceramic, and it could potentially give you a, uh, a false reading. So make sure that you get one that's the metal, the, the gray type ball bar, uh, not the ceramic ball bar. Uh, and that would be my recommendation for that. Thank you. Um, before we get into there's there's some great questions in here about parts. So before I get into the parts question, Nick, I wanted to do one more thing here, um, which is somebody asked, could you just scan the back of your hand, just scanning into Design X, no processing, no anything else, something that could show the curvature <laughs> process? Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's okay. I, I love uh, I love fun uh, requests like this. So let's just go and we'll insert a new scan. Okay, I'll put my scan on top, or my hand on top of the part here. Uh, I have this pretty close to the table. Again, remember the volume, we can, we can pull it out further. You can see the reflection off my ring. Uh, my wife will appreciate that. It's uh, you know, kind of overexposed a little bit there. Um, we'll just hit the scan. Now, the, the nice thing about this, and we didn't mention this a lot earlier, was the exposure time is really, really fast. So where we shot at about 17 milliseconds, that's more than enough to uh, you know, get rid of any vibration or anything. If you expose up to the higher level here, then you need to worry about motion and vibration. But at the fast exposure, it's very good. So let's look at that. Uh, that scan. Let me move my video here. So that's how uh, there's the scan of my hands, and that's in low res, remember. So high res is even finer detail. And you know, you can you can start to see a little bit of the uh, the pixels here. You know, high res is even even better than that. But you can see all the uh, the wrinkles in my knuckles and everything there. So it looks pretty good. Your hands look great. They they do look fantastic. I, I have to say, I've been working in the yard a lot in this cold weather, um, <laughs> making them a little bit rough. <laughs> um, so let's move on to some part questions here. Um, so uh, we have a couple things here. Um, I'm inspecting white parts, white plastic parts, SLS material. Is there a problem with the type of material, level of transparency? And also, Nick, in the same part, can you maybe cover a little bit about reflective parts and reflective surface issues as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, white, S are they SLS or SLA? What was the? SLS. SLS. Okay, so white SLS is a, a selective laser sintered. So Usually, it's uh, the, the material is a little dull. The finish on it's a little dull, and that's really nice. A dull white part is super easy to see. the The pattern is really easy to see. Uh, it's probably an ideal. You know, uh, uh, painted with white primer, um, flat white primer or flat gray primer. Those are you know, if you have to do any you know testing in house or you just want to have a nice part to practice with, those are great. So the color of the SLS is fine. Um, the amount that the light would sink in should be pretty negligible on that. I mentioned the ceramic earlier because that actually is like teeth and, and you can actually get kind of a, a sublayer or you would see uh, what you're picking up is within the surface. 
SLS, usually not a problem. The white SLS material is usually very good. Um, for SLA that's slightly translucent, you may want to powder it or, you know, if it's uh, straight off the machine and it's still wet, you don't want to scan it then, but you may want to powder that, depends. You know, it's going to be part specific. And then for really shiny parts, uh, reflections can be an issue and that's why we do preparation of the part. And that's why putting powder on it will get rid of some of those reflections. You would tend to see reflections uh, in the in the areas down here. Uh, that would be where the, the cylindrical face would reflect onto the flat face. So that's why you'd want to spray something like that to get rid of those reflections. If you had reflections and if you had um, extraneous data, you saw how easy it was to pick that table and delete it. Those would be identified in different regions, so you can just pick them and delete them. So I wouldn't worry about it. I would try it both ways. Um, you know, once you get this, your particular workflow, you'll be able to fine tune it. So try it both ways and see which one works better. Um, just a few more questions. Uh, and thank you everybody for just letting me in. So hopefully we're answering them to the best of our ability. And if not, there'll be some follow up afterwards. We'll make sure to, uh, to, to touch base on, on some that maybe we weren't touching on here. Um, Nick, you mentioned uh, creating a nerve surface, which I'm familiar with, but I was wondering if Design X can generate lofted surfaces. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, one of my other favorite tools is the loft wizard. Um, we don't have any good geometry here to, to use it, but if I, let me just uh, hide that guy. The uh, loft wizard basically will let you take and fit geometry across the part and you can pick the UV directions. So let's go ahead and, and pick that. So there's the extrusion wizard, there's revolve, there's a revolve wizard, there's a loft wizard. So if I pick the loft wizard, the way that works, let me move my, my camera here. What I've done is I'm I'm over this particular area here. And you can choose to do a plane or a curve as the section is the uh, kind of the path and then you choose the direction you want your UV lines to go so the UV lines are going to be going across the, the areas here and then you can choose whether you want to specify the number of sections by deviation or by, or by the number of sections some people say I only want five five slices some people say I need it to be within 0.1 millimeter so you need to choose which one that is. And then you choose how you want your profiles to look. So in this case, reference planes and mesh sketches. So let's do a quick preview of that. So what we've got here is a bunch of slices through that and the planes. Well, this, this shape, this particular geometry is planar, but the point is you, if you had curvature to that, you could easily have all your cross sections and if you need more cross sections you can easily add additional cross sections in there. That's a great question, thanks. Yeah, so while we're on the process of that nerves and kind of conversation, another one came up, can we scan an organic shape and import it into freeform? Oh, absolutely. That's um, the process for getting it into freeform, you would scan it into here, you would make your mesh, remember the, the mesh object here that we've got, and then just save that out. At this point, you would save it out as an STL or an OBJ, and then you would bring that STL or OBJ into Freeform. And then you would convert, inside of Freeform, you would say convert to clay, and that would convert it to voxels and fill in any holes, and uh, then you'd pick your voxel size. Uh, what is the greatest point of density, uh, point density of the scanner? That's a good question. I, I would need to uh, it's not listed on the spec sheet. What you could do is um, take a shot and measure from point to point. That's something I could do uh, do a little bit later and get back to you on that one. And um, so these last couple questions here are kind of related more towards Design X with capture out of kind of the way here. But uh, the first question is: I have one scanner of 3D digital twerp of Model 300 is an old scanner but can I use it with your system? So will DesignX allow it to plug in and scan directly and live, live into the platform? Um, 3D Digital, uh, they're working on plugins. 
there isn't a there isn't a native plugin for the three D digital scanner, but from their scanning application, you can save out points, or you can save out uh, vertexes. So what I would do from there is I would just save the individual scans, then import them into Design X, and then go through that same process we did. So just scanning with the native app for the, your scanner, and then bring the data into here. Um, and on on the on the topic of scanners. Can you talk a little bit about some of the scanners that are supported by DesignX? Yeah. So from a, a neutrality standpoint, we support every scanner on the market. So I, I haven't seen devices that we don't support in some way, shape, or form. The, the qualifying factor there is a lot of scanners have maybe their own proprietary scanning application, say a CT scanner. We don't need to use the CT scanner software within here, but you would run the CT scanner and then spit out an STL. So we accept the import of all the different file formats, STL, OBJ, Vertex, PLI, you name it, we support the import of that. Now as far as supporting particular devices uh, directly bringing data in, you know, we support Capture, of course, that's ours. We support the Creoform scanners, uh, the Z Corp scanner, which is the same as the Creoform scanner. The Kanaka Minolta Vivids are supported, Broikman, Shining 3D, and the Range 7. So those are all scanners which we can directly drive. They plug in and we actually say take a scan and, and come in. Now this other one here, Live Scan, that will connect to a Ferro Arm, a Romer Arm, a Nikon, uh, the basis with the scanner. There's all those different scanners out there that are on an arm, generally speaking will connect to those via live scan. All right, last couple questions. Um, one, again, dealing with the can you, uh, can you do curvature based decimation? Uh, yeah. If you go into the mesh editing under decimation in more options and then in uh, high curvature areas. So uh, inside of a product like GMagic Studio, there's a slider for um, curvature-based decimation. Here, it's just got a different name, and it's in a slightly different spot. So you would crank this up to dense, and that would keep uh, more more triangles in the higher areas of higher uh, curvature. The, the example I want to show is on, on this particular model. You can see uh, on the edges here, those are the actual tri those are the, the points from the shot. But in the flatter areas, there's fewer fewer vertices. Um, and Nick, the last question here um, kind of pertains to a little bit about about the product itself. So, um, you know, in terms of the learning curves and everything else. So, what is the average length of time required to become proficient with DesignX and specifically the routine you just performed, you know, in combination with the system with Capture? Yeah, absolutely. The, the training is three days and that will get you through learning how to use DesignX. The, when I started using DesignX months ago, I'd never used it before, but I consider myself a strong SolidWorks and SpaceClaim and DesignDirect user, so I know CAD pretty well. I actually did a, a test part where I modeled it first in DesignDirect, then I brought the STL into DesignX and modeled the same part. The part took me an hour and a half to do the first time in DesignDirect, having never used it before using Design X, I did that same part in about two hours, uh, which is fantastic because the, what took me time was figuring out which buttons did what I needed. If you understand the process of doing CAD and drawing parts in CAD, this is extremely fast and easy to, to learn. The only thing that you really need to get your hands around is what does scan data look like and what are the processes and you know what are the settings I want to use for my parts. And you'll get that once you scan a few times. I would say, you know, you go through training, it's three days, and then you use it uh, uh, several times a week. By the end of the first month, you should be pretty darn good. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for all the, uh, all the great demonstrations as well as the questions and answers that you're able to provide. Um, for those that asked, yes, a copy of the webinar will be sent. There will be a follow-up email going out tomorrow. Uh, that will have a streaming video of the um, 
a streaming video of the uh, webinar as well as some other information about the product. Uh, this time next week, next Thursday, January 30th at 11 a.m., we'll also be hosting a webinar on uh, capture for geometric control. We'll talk about the automated inspection process that this product and system provides. Uh, and that registration link will also be provided to you in the follow-up email. Uh, so thank you again. If there are any questions that were left unanswered, they will be answered offline as soon as possible by one of our regional sales managers. And uh, we appreciate your time. And Nick, again, thanks for a great presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day.